All right, in this video, we're going to look at double integrals over rectangular regions. This video goes along with section 5.1 of the OpenStax textbook calculus volume three. So we're going to need to identify integrable functions and use an integrated integral notation. We'll talk about volume under a surface and connect this integral to the average value of a function. So the same kind of functions from chapter four, a function of two variables, a curved sheet floating in three space. We are gonna limit the domain, which has always been some subset of R2 to being just a rectangle, uh, where X goes from A to B and Y goes from C to D. We're also gonna limit the function to being non-negative. So imagine it's above the XY plane and let's have well-behaved functions for now. So this function is continuous. I'm gonna use this set theory notation uh, when we do these integrals. So it's good to get familiar with it. So uh, big R is this rectangle, a uh, set of all points in the XY plane where X is between A and B and Y is between C and D. So there's just a way of writing in set notation this rectangle. Now, uh, so in a bird's eye view of this rectangle, we're gonna chop it up into a bunch of smaller rectangles. So you see X going from A to B, and uh, this would be X zero, X one, X two, all the way up to Xn. And the spacing is gonna be, uh, uniform is gonna be delta X. And the Y, Y goes from C to D, Y zero, Y one, Y two, all the way up to Ym and uh, the spacing between the y's is delta y. So we chop the rec big rectangle up into a bunch of smaller rectangles and they're double indexed. Uh, i is the index in the x direction and j is the index in the y direction. So this rectangle here is r sub i j. And what we just need is one point to sample from in each rectangle. Uh, and it actually doesn't matter where in the rectangles you sample the point uh, because this ends up being a Riemann sum and we take the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity and their size goes to zero. And so eventually it will just be the size of a point anyway. Uh, but that point would be x i j star y i j star. Uh, for a specific rectangle, you could look at x two three star, y two three star, this one here. All right, so we chop our big rectangle up into a bunch of smaller rectangles. We pick a point, any point inside each one, and then we're going to find the value of the function at that point. So it's our sample point. Uh, and so here's that rectangle we chopped up. And let's look at this one little rectangle. We picked our sample point, and we're going to evaluate the function at that sample point. And that will, of course, be a point on the surface. And we'll use that z value as the height of this little rectangular column. So we think of it as a thin rectangular box or solid. So sample point x i j star y i j star. Now the area of the base is actually the same for all these rectangles because we were uniform in the delta x's and delta y's. So the area delta a for each little rectangle is delta x times delta y. But the volume for each will be different because the surface has different heights. Uh, and so we need to take that area and multiply it by the value of the function at your sample point. So, you know, volume of a box is length times width times height. And that's all we're doing here, right? Length, width, and then this is your height. Uh, now, this is the volume of one of these little boxes. Uh, we're going to have one for each of the little rectangles. So we would need to sum uh, i goes from 1 to m and j goes from 1 to n. You need to do a double summation because you're summing along two dimensions. Uh, but each one of them is the same expression here. Uh, and this would give you the total volume of all the rectangles, which is an approximation for the volume uh, between the xy plane and this surface. That's going to be a little bit off because of the curved nature of this. Uh, and we're kind of replacing it with a bunch of rectangular steps. Uh, but 
it's a good approximation and it will get better the more rectangles we have. So just like with integrals in Calc 1, we will take the limit as the number of rectangles goes to infinity. And of course their size goes to zero. Well, the size of the area of the base goes to zero. Uh, and that <clears throat> will be the definition of the double integral of a function of two variables. So that's where that comes from. And it's just the volume between the xy plane and the surface. Uh, now you can get more comfortable with this by doing some approximations using a midpoint approximation, which means your x star, x i j star, y i j star is just the midpoint of each rectangle. So let's look at this simple function. Uh, z is 3x squared minus y. And we want to integrate it uh, where x goes from 0 to 2 and y goes from 0 to 2. Uh, if we were to have m and n equal to 2, how many boxes would I have in my approximation? Uh, the correct answer is b4, because uh, you would have uh, it's chopped up in half in both directions, right? So you'd have uh, two in the x direction and two in the y direction. And so you'd get four boxes. And in general, the number of boxes should be n times n. Here's a look at those four boxes. Uh, and then I want to, luckily the area of each of these is just one. So we don't really need to worry about that in the actual calculation. It'll just be times one. I need to find the midpoint of each of these boxes. So uh, which of these points is not a midpoint? You can pause the recording if you need some time. Uh, it's a little bit of a trick. D is not a midpoint. It's a midpoint of the overall domain. Um, but we want midpoints of the smaller rectangles. Uh, and so we'd be using, uh, I guess right here, this midpoint would be one half, one half. And then uh, this one would be one half, three halves, which is B, uh, three halves, three halves, which is A, would be the center of that one. And then this would be one half, three halves. Oh, that's B. This should be three halves, one half, because you've gone out three halves in the X direction, right? So this is actually C. So A, B, and C are those uh, those three there. And then the first one wasn't on there, and D was correct. So we would use those points, the midpoints of each of these small rectangles for our sample points. And we would evaluate the function at those points. And it would look like this. So there's one half, one half, three halves, one half, one half, three halves, three halves, three halves. And then we just take those coordinates and put them in the function. Uh, and you get some function value. And then everything's multiplied by one um, to make it have the volume that we wanted. And then you add them all up, and we get an approximation of 11. So 11 is an approximation of the volume between the, the surface, this function, and the xy plane. Now we want to actually get into doing some integration, but we need some properties before we can define double integrals over general regions. Uh, and some of the properties in theorem 5.1, uh, we can distribute a double integral over a sum. We can distribute it, or rather, factor out a constant. And then this one's real important, uh, that if the rectangle that we're integrating over can be decomposed into the union of two sets that are non-overlapping except on the boundaries, uh, then you can break up the double integral uh, into a double integral over each of those subsets. We'll use that one in the next section. Uh, other three properties, if uh, f is less than g over the whole rectangle, then the integral of f is less than the integral of g. Uh, sort of a squeeze theorem, if f is between little m and big m, then the integral of f is between little m times the area and big m times the area of the rectangle. 
Uh, and then uh, there was one like this for integrals, uh, single integrals, that if uh, f is equal to g times h, uh, then you can write the integral as the product of integrals. Notice here, g has to be just a function of x, and h is just a function of y. And this becomes very helpful when we evaluate them later on, too. So we will actually evaluate these double integrals is through an iterative process, meaning we do one integral and then we do another. Uh, one of the integrals will be x and one will be y. We could do y first and then x. We could do x first and then y. Uh, and we should get the same result either way. Now, if we're integrating with respect to y first, uh, and we have sort of a fixed x value, uh, and we're finding the area of this rectangle uh, where it's still kind of a function of what that x value is. So you're fixing x, but you're leaving it arbitrary and then finding this area as a function of x. Then you would integrate that function uh, to get the overall value. If you did x first, then you would fix y, and you would find the area of this rectangle as a function of y then integrate it with respect to y. Bubini's theorem, uh, which is theorem 5.2 here, says that uh, if f is continuous, uh, then the two iterative integrals doing y first then x, or x first then y, should give you the same result. Um, now, it's proven easily when f is continuous, um, but it's actually true as long as f is bounded and uh, continuous everywhere except a finite number of continuous curves. All right, and then that's it. We'll go on to the methodology for doing these double integrals over rectangular regions. This presentation by Matthew Watts contains images and text from Calculus Volume 3 by Jed Herman and G. Strange, uh, CC by NCSA OpenStax.